Good evening, everyone. Let me first thank the public for being here today and acknowledging that this conference is being recorded and will be, become permanently available online. I am here to make a brief presentation of Philippe Descola, our keynote speaker. Philippe Descola is one of the most important contemporary thinkers. His work is a landmark in philosophy, anthropology, and the history of art. He has a unique proposal on the diverse ways in which different people compose worlds, namely the relationship between non-humans and humans. Philippe Descola first studied philosophy at the École Normale Supérieure before training in anthropology at the University of Paris X and the École Pratique des Hautes Études. He conducted extensive fieldwork from 1976 to 1979 among the indigenous Jivaru Ashwar of the Ecuadorian Amazon. This resulted in his doctoral thesis, defended in 1983 under the direction of Claude Lévi-Strauss, professor at the Collège de France until 1920, uh, sorry, uh, 2019, in the chair of Anthropology of Nature, which he founded, Philippe Descola directed the Social Anthropology Laboratory there until 2013, while maintaining a direction of studies at the École des Hautes-Études en Sciences Sociales. Philippe received the CNRS Silver Medal in 1996 and the Gold Medal in 2012, the Edouard Bonfou Prize from the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences in 2011, the gold medal from the French Academy of Agriculture in 2014, and the Cosmos Prize from Japan in 2014. He is also a foreign member of the British Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and Dr. Honoris Causa of the University of Montreal. His curriculum is, of course, too extensive to be even summarized. But I will like to highlight the fact that he was not only an invited professor in several top universities around the world, such as Chicago, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Beijing, Cornell University, Cambridge, and the Land School of Economics, but also specifically in the Portuguese-speaking world, holding the University of Sao Paulo a cathedra in Levestros, and also another one in the University of Rio de Janeiro. Philippe Descola has delivered many notable uh, lectures, and including the Cl uh, Clifford Goetz Memorial Lecture at Princeton and the Hartley Brown Lecture at the British Academy. His published work is of also very extensive. I will highlight, however, those publications which mark his influential uh, thinking in anthropology and beyond, starting with the monograph published in French and immediately after in English in 1986, with the title In the Society of Nature, A Native Ecology in Amazonia. Here he contests the reductionist view of indigenous people adaptation to the environment in the Amazonian forests, proposing a sophisticated perspective on mutual relationships between the Ashwa and certain plants or specific animals. He became since then a main figure in re-establishing what is now named the renewed anthropology of animism and in making anthropology on Amazonia, becoming key in the theorization in anthropology at large. In 2003, Descola published his monumental study, translated into English in 2005, under the title Beyond Nature and Culture. The book is now translated in 10 different languages. It, is, it offers a new approach to ways of distributing continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans, based on a structural conception of ontology, understood as a classification of the qualities of beings and systematic of the relationships that unite them. The book presents a four-fold typology of generic ontological types, 
animism, totemism, analogism, and naturalism, under which historically and ethnographically known cosmologies can be thought and understood. The conference he's going to present to us today is inscribed in his most recent publication, which came out only two years ago in 2021, and is still available only in French. Um, here's the book, Les Formes du Visible, and it has been published last week in, in, Germ in German, I've just learned that, and it will come out in September in Portuguese uh, in Brazil. Um, so the book uh, is called the Les Formes du Visible, Une Anthropologie de la Figuration, where he develops his thinking somehow arising from the same fourfold typology of generic ontological types, which were experimented in the exhibition La Fabrique des Images, curated by Philippe Descola in 2010-2011 in the Museum of Quebranly in Paris. It is an honor for us to have Philippe Descola here in person in Kulturgerst in Lisbon, so I will not take any further time presenting him. After his speech, which will take around one hour, we will have about 40 minutes uh, for debate. So, Philippe Descola, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for this uh, generous uh, presentation. Uh, Boa tarde a todos. Uh, I, it's the, the only thing I'll say in Portuguese. I, I do not want to inflict upon you my uh, very bad Portuguese. Um, so I'll follow on in English. Uh, this talk is about images, but before entering into the uh, domain of images, I would like to say a few words of, about the reasons that uh, incited me to uh, uh, become interested in images. Um, as it is the case for uh, anthropologists, the initial uh, impetus came from my fieldwork in Amazonia, which Susanna uh, mentioned. Uh, I uh, became interested in Amazonia for a number of reasons, but mainly because what could be uh, read about the from the first chronicles to uh, recent literature in the 70s about the people of the lowland uh, of South America um, presented a sort of enigma. Uh, they were uh, described on the one hand as people without institutions. Uh, in French, uh, sans foi, sans loi, sans roi without king, without faith, uh, without law. And uh, because none of the institutions that could be identified in Europe at, the, uh, at that time was present among them, and also by contrast with the civilizations that the, uh, the, uh, the colonists were encountering uh, in, uh, uh, in the Andes and in Mexico. And so, uh, it became and is, was still an enigma uh, in the 1970s when I became interested in Amazonia as to why these people were uh, so anomic, as we say in uh, uh, our sociological vocabulary that is apparently without uh, integrative institutions. On the other hand, uh, most uh, 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 chroniclers and uh, travelers, uh, proto-ethnographs, uh, mentioned also uh, that these people of the lowlands uh, of South America were in a way extremely close to nature in the sense that they uh, apparently uh, uh, were leaving out of the fruits that a generous nature uh, had uh, uh, were, was giving them, and on the other hand, uh, they were also uh, brutish in the sense that they uh, uh, waged wars, 
uh, and wars of vendetta. Uh, they were known for eating each other also. Uh, and so uh, there was a, a sort of, of bizarre uh, uh, aura uh, around them. On the one hand, they had no institutions. On the other hand, they were almost a sort of expansion of natural beings, uh, either because they were savages or white people uh, who had no uh, precise institutions, or because they lived uh, easily out of the fruits of nature. And so this, this, this combination uh, led me to imagine that perhaps if there was no institution that was identifiable as the kind of, uh, uh, of institutions that we are used to uh, in Europe. It was because perhaps their social life had been, uh, had expanded uh, way beyond the humans in order to uh, include non-humans. And it is with this idea that I uh, uh, went to uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon with my wife and Christine Taylor uh, and spent a few years there uh, to study how uh, a specific group, the Achua, uh, uh, were dealing with uh, non-humans, uh, which I called nature at the time. Uh, I used the expression non-human afterwards. And uh, the, what I did is the kind of ethnographic work that uh, all ethnographers do, that is, I recorded very uh, much in detail the technical and symbolic tools that uh, the Achua used in order to deal with plants and animals and spirits, etc. And uh, uh, I also uh, discovered after a few months, that is when I began to understand what the people were saying, because it took some time to learn their language, that uh, in fact what I had come to study was uh, uh, in fact n not correctly uh, uh, presented in the sense that they, these people were not socializing nature in the traditional sense because nature for them did not exist. Uh, what existed were a number of non-humans, of plants, animals, spirits, with whom they interacted daily in different forms, in particular through uh, dreams, uh, the, the, the recounting of dreams and the interpretation of dream was a very important uh, uh, aspect of their life. Every morning before uh, sunrise, people would uh, gather around the fires and discuss the dreams of the night. And uh, some of these dreams were, could be interpreted in terms of classic colonial romance, if you wish. That is, uh, they, they, they were signs of things that could be done uh, uh, during the day by, with interpretation by some uh, sort of grammar of inversions. If you dream, uh, if you would dream of uh, uh, um, finding, of uh, encountering a troop of uh, enemies, for instance, it was a good omen for uh, hunting peccaries. So there was a, 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 an inversion between uh, humans and non-humans there. Or if you uh, uh, dreamt of uh, uh, fishing, for instance, it was uh, a good omen for going uh, to hunt with a blowgun, with an, an inversion between water, air, etc. Et so this grammar was quite common and easy to uh, interpret. And there were other dreams where uh, plants and animals under uh, a human appearance would uh, appear to uh, the dreamer and uh, deliver a message. Uh, all kinds of different messages uh, cons concerning daily life, in fact. For instance, a, a, a plant of manioc would uh, uh, appear as a young girl in the dream of a woman who cultivated uh, the, uh, the, 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 the plot of manioc, 
saying that she was being poisoned. And it was because she had been planted very near uh, a, a, a plant that is used for uh, fishing with poison. And so she, uh, or a, a holler monkey, or a capuchin monkey would visit a man and uh, uh, fix him uh, uh, a meeting uh, for the next day. And that was an idea, or we would say that, come and meet my, uh, my sisters tomorrow. And this would uh, imply that he would be uh, waiting for him, for the hunter to be able to hunt uh, this uh, monkey. So this kind of communication uh, uh, meant uh, that non-humans were not a sort of in undifferentiated uh, nature, but a, a, a series of social partners with whom uh, some forms of understanding and relationship were possible. Also, um, the uh, Achua uh, and other uh, people in Amazonia, and that is uh, the result of the type of ethno-ecological studies I was doing, um, had a, a technique or techniques for cultivations uh, which are now well known, that is they practice slash and burn horticulture. It means that they cut a little bit of the forest, uh, burn the, uh, uh, the vegetal residues, and uh, plant uh, domesticated plants, which have been domesticated in this part of the world for about 8,000 years, but also uh, transplant from the forest uh, uncultivated plants, or white plants, if you wish. And these plants, when the, the garden is uh, uh, abandoned after a few uh, years, um, uh, tend to subsist in the sense that cultivated plants are, are, are destroyed very rapidly by the, the colonization of the wild plants. Wild, wild plants that have been transplanted uh, survive better. The result of this is if you imagine this process going on for several uh, uh, generations, several centuries, several millennia, is that the composition of the forest has been changed because, uh, the, uh, uh, because of this process in many parts of Amazonia. In that sense, the Amazonian forest is not the last piece of wilderness on the surface of the earth. It is, in part, a cultivated forest, a non-intentional cultivated forest, but nevertheless, people are aware uh, of this process of transformation uh, of the composition of the forest uh, through time. And so it's not as if they had been uh, parachuted into a society had been, uh, had been uh, 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 dropped from the air uh, into uh, 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 an ecosystem. Uh, this ecosystem has been created as a niche, uh, as an ecological niche by the populations of uh, the lowlands of South America over the millennia. So there were, these, there were two reasons for for which the, uh, using the, an opposition between nature and society was irrelevant in this ethnographic context. And when I came back, uh, I set myself as a goal to try to understand the uh, different forms of uh, continuity and discontinuity between uh, humans and non-humans that had been uh, conceptualized by humans uh, around the planet. And of course, there was a first opposition, which was the one I had come with as an intellectual tool, which was uh, the, the opposition between nature and society, which I, I although I never uh, uh, before 
uh, my fieldwork uh, uh, think about the possibility of it being universal or not. I suspected it was universal because my uh, doctoral supervisor, Claude de Vistros, had been using it as a sort of universal feature in order to understand uh, uh, mythical uh, processes and forms of cooking and many other aspects of social life uh, all his life. Uh, but I realized when I came back that it, there was no universality in this opposition between nature and society or nature and culture. And uh, I, uh, I, I became aware that it was precisely the reverse of what I've been observing among the Achua, which among the Achua, most non-humans, not all, but most, uh, have an interiority, a subjectivity, a soul, that is, you can communicate with them. Uh, you can uh, send them messages, not only in dreams, but also by singing songs that are addressed to their uh, uh, soul, that, to their heart, uh, in order to influence their behavior without them being completely conscious of that. And you can use the same device for uh, 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 influencing uh, uh, humans also. And so, uh, on the one hand, there was this generality, not universality, but generality of non-humans having uh, an interiority similar to that of humans, which allowed them to communicate with humans and to communicate between themselves. And on the other hand, uh, so which contrasted with, with our own way of uh, thinking about this, which is uh, uh, the human exceptionality in terms of moral and cognitive uh, uh, capacities, uh, which was uh, progressively uh, established uh, beginning in the 17th century and then developed uh, in the following years, in following centuries. Uh, and the other contrast between uh, what I brought in my intellectual toolbox and what I was observing was the fact that the, for the Achua, every form of life has different capacities and different ways of uh, dealing with the world because of its uh, physical dispositions. And it, this is quite uh, understandable and uh, uh, it, 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 it has been the the basis uh, of uh, an ethological theory by uh, the uh, ethologist uh, Jacob von Uxkill, for instance, the idea that the physical dispositions of, uh, of, uh, of animals allow them to compose a world which is based on the, their capacity to extract from this world food, information, uh, relationships, etc. So this was more or less the, the way that the Achua conceived of the relationship between uh, uh, forms of life, uh, not exclusively uh, species. Uh, Valdemar Bogoras, a, a great Russian ethnographer, uh, wrote of the Chukchi uh, people uh, who lived on the uh, other side of the Strait of Bering from, the, from Alaska, uh, that they uh, think, he says, or they believe that uh, even the, the, the shadows on the wall uh, uh, live in their villages where they subsist on hunting. So it meant, uh, in, in, in that case, that these forms of life are not necessarily species, but morphological forms of life, precisely, uh, have their own ways of dealing with the world because of their specific um, uh, physical dispositions. And this was, of course, the reverse of what we in the West have been thinking. It, that is the idea uh, that uh, uh, humans are distinctive because of their moral and cognitive uh, capacities, but uh, are under the same rules 
as all other elements of the world because they uh, uh, respond to the same laws of physics, chemistry, and then biology uh, that all other uh, components or elements of the world. So there were continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans in both cases, but they did not uh, follow the same lines. On the one hand, among the Achua, and are there many other uh, uh, people uh, around the world that I uh, finally uh, uh, called uh, animist, as Susanna uh, said, uh, resuscitate, re re reawakening uh, uh, or, uh, uh, a word that had been a, a little bit discredited over the, uh, over the, over the years. Uh, these people, who are not, not only uh, living in Amazonia, but in northern North America, Siberia, in some parts of Southeast Asia, in some parts of Melanesia, uh, have all the same way of worlding, that is, of composing worlds, by uh, maintaining uh, 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 the, 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 the idea that humans and non-humans are continuous in terms of interiority, but discontinuous in terms of physicality. And this is completely the reverse of what I had brought again in my intellectual uh, toolbox, and which I ended up by uh, calling naturalism, that is a way of uh, a worlding that became apparent uh, in, the, in, in the texts in the 17th century, then expanded uh, up to now, uh, which, on the contrary, uh, insists on the discontinuity between interiority, that is, uh, humans are exceptional in having an interiority, and uh, insists on the continuity of physical dimensions between humans and non-humans. And so, um, when I uh, started uh, to... Uh, uh, work on this supposition, it, um, I, I set as, a, as, as, a, as an objective, as a, an intellectual uh, challenge, uh, to um, try to uh, discover uh, or model uh, the different ways according to which humans, and no, uh, uh, humans around the, the, the world uh, uh, organize continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. Naturalism, which was our own way of doing that, was one way of doing it. What I called animism was another way of doing it, but there were still different ways that I had not considered. And so um, there were two more, which Susanna mentioned, uh, one of them was uh, 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 the result of my uh, reading of the uh, uh, ethnography on Aboriginal Australia. Uh, and this uh, ethnography deals mainly with uh, a term that was forged at the time, totemism. And there are different interpretations of totemism, but the one I uh, finally ended up with uh, is the idea that uh, humans and non-humans uh, share certain physical and moral features within a group, a totemic group, and these uh, uh, features differ from other totemic groups where humans and non-humans share uh, different qualities. These qualities were transmitted or reactualized in, at every generation uh, uh, because initially a set of prototypes, uh, which were formerly called totems, uh, uh, went uh, um, uh, or emerge from the earth at, at the surface of the earth uh, and uh, had uh, different adventures uh, which resulted in transforming uh, the uh, 
the relief, the, 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 the topography uh, of the Earth in Australia, and uh, then disappeared. But before disappearing, they left uh, sort of seeds that are called uh, 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 in the ethnography uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of Australia uh, 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 soul children, uh, which uh, in fact uh, re are incorporated at each generation in the humans and non-humans of a totemic group in order to perpetuate their ontological identity. So that was an, another form of uh, perceiving continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. In that case, of course, continuities on both a moral and a physical dimension, but discontinuities between different groups which incorporated different qualities and thus had different appearances, different uh, uh, um, forms of acting, different morphologies also, uh, uh, different behavior, etc., etc. And the last, the last uh, way uh, uh, of uh, composing world, or worlding, is one uh, that is uh, familiar to us because it belongs to our almost immediate past, which is the Middle Ages, and then uh, and, and part of the Renaissance, and, uh, and, the, and antiquity. And it's the idea that the world is composed of a great number of different elements. Uh, and so the world is composed of very heterogeneous parts. And in order to live in such a world, in order to make it livable, or in, the conceptual, uh, and to conceptualize it, one has to find elements of correspondence between these very different uh, elements. And these uh, uh, correspondences are always based on analogical reasoning. And this is why I called this way of worlding analogism. To give you a very simple example, uh, the, 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 the relationship between uh, the macrocosmos and the microcosmos, that is, with the body, the human body as a sort of world in miniature that has a correspondence with uh, the wider cosmos, in, with elements in the cosmos in the sense of water, uh, fire, earth, etc or with uh, cosmic bodies is something that is w a, a very clear sign of an analogy system. You don't get these kind of homologies uh, among uh, animists uh, uh, collectives or among totemic collectives. And it subsists uh, in our world as a, a, a survival, for instance, in horoscopes. No? So these forms of correspondence, uh, which I call analogism, was the fourth way of uh, 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 conceptualizing and enforcing continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. I published the result of this uh, uh, thought process, which went on for many years, in a, in a book that Susanna mentioned, Beyond Nature and Culture. And then at that time, I, uh, I uh, made an hypothesis, which is the following. If um, these propositions are uh, sound, uh, then uh, they should be uh, um, visible in other uh, forms or in other uh, materials than the one I'd been using. The materials I'd been using were texts. They were myths, they were uh, uh, either uh, mythology or implicit mythology, that is the, what is behind the ritual uh, action 
uh, that people uh, uh, um, uh, organize uh, in their daily life. Uh, they were visible in, uh, in uh, philosophical texts, in uh, medical uh, treaties, etc., etc. Uh, what if uh, I uh, would look at images to see whether these ways of welding uh, would be visible there also? And so I, uh, I, um, I devised an exhibition at the Musée du, Quai, uh, the Musée du Quai Branly, which was an experiment which uh, Susanna mentioned, La Fabrique des Images, in order to see whether a public which, who was not familiar with the kind of images I was showing would uh, uh, understand the kind of contrast that I was making between images belonging to different uh, ontological regimes. And uh, it was a, a success in the sense that uh, it was an, an experiment because I talked a lot with the visitors. I looked at the, uh, uh, the golden book where people made uh, remarks. I talked with the, uh, uh, the guides who um, uh, accompanied the, 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 the visitors and, uh, had, of course, they were the first exposed to their questions, etc., etc. And so when I understood that what I was trying to show was uh, uh, understood by a, a general public, I decided to go on. And this is when I uh, devoted several years of my uh, lectures at the Collège de France to this topic. And this ended in a book, The Forms of the Visible. And uh, this book had uh, three uh, objectives. On the one hand, to show in images how worlds are organized, not necessarily but what the images show, but by the ways that images are constructed, their spatial, their visual uh, uh, space, uh, how it is organized, um, by the kind of continuities and discontinuities that the, these images uh, render uh, obvious, etc. I will give you a few examples uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, the, um, the second objective uh, was to um, uh, examine the forms, the, the, formal, the formal devices that these different um, uh, uh, figurative regime used in order to uh, uh, render visible precisely the features of each of the ontological regimes. And uh, I'll take just one example for that. Uh, I became very strongly aware by working on this uh, that what we are now used to, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the a form of, when I say we, uh, we Europeans, no, uh, a form of uh, figuration uh, that uh, um, appeared uh, in the 15th century as a, a, an attempt at emulating human vision uh, was something very specific in the history of images in the sense that it was entirely predicated on the idea of monoperspectivism, that is, on adopting a single perspective on a being or on a scene. And of course, uh, the uh, uh, ideal typical form of this is the monofocal perspective invented in uh, northern Italy, which, as uh, Panofsky has uh, shown, is entirely constructed out of the gaze of a spectator organizing the visual space from his own perspective. A few, a few years before that, in uh, medieval paintings, you had uh, still uh, 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 the most common f form of organization of the visual space 
in images in whole humanity, which is polyperspectivism, that is, images where the same scene, for instance, was seen from different points of view. For instance, you had a scene of hunting uh, with uh, animals that were seen uh, uh, standing, uh, uh, a piece of water seen from the sky with someone uh, uh, swimming in it, seen again from the sky, etc. So there were different perspectives. And this form, this organization, of, this formal organization of the visual space, polyperspectivism, has been the most common, but with local differences. I won't talk about that today because that would, uh, uh, that would take too long. I'll give you an, a, a, an example of a very classical form of polyperspectivism that was uh, uh, described initially by the great uh, American anthropologist Franz Boas, uh, which is uh, 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 it's, it's a panel in front of the house among the Tsimtian in uh, on the northwest coast of uh, uh, Canada, uh, which represents a, a, a bear. And uh, the, when you look at it, it looks like a bear seen f from uh, the front. But in fact, it's a bear that has been uh, divided along a, a, a dividing line, which is not visible. And the, the two flanks of the bear, uh, of the bear, sorry, uh, are, uh, uh, <laughs> are uh, deployed uh, on uh, both sides of this vertical axis, and it shows because there is a notch in the in the in the in the front of the bear, uh, which is the starting point of the two flanks. No, and so what. What is the difference between monoperspectivism and polyperspectivism? Monoperspectivism uh, tries to render the world as a human sees it. Polyperspectivism, in its different forms, uh, attempts at accumulating a greater number of qualities, of visible qualities, of a being or a scene. And this is obtained, for instance, precisely by showing uh, 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 an animal uh, uh, which is of which you see not only uh, which appears to be uh, uh, seen from the front, but in fact is depicted uh, with, the, with the back also, uh, but deployed on the same plane. This is the second aspect of what I intended to do. Uh, again, I won't talk, apart from what I've said, I won't talk about that. Uh, and the third aspect is um, uh, an expansion of a tendency among art historians um, of the past 20 years, let's say, to deal with images not so much as aggregates of symbols, but as agents of social life. This was initially very clear in a great figure in the history of art, which was uh, Abbe Warburg. Uh, but it was uh, developed af afterwards, much later, by people like uh, David Friedberg in the United States, uh, Horst Bredekamp, and uh, Hans Belting in Germany, and in anthropology by um, a great figure, uh, Alfred Gell, uh, who wrote a very important book, uh, precisely defending this perspective that uh, images had to be seen as agents of social life that were active and uh, had uh, 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 triggered reactions from the people who looked at them or interacted with them. And uh, what I tried to do in this book is to show that the agency of images was not based on a single uh, process, but were uh, activated by different mechanisms that varied according to the figurative regime 
to which these images belonged. Uh, so, uh, to give a, a, a simple example, uh, the, the activation for uh, of the agency of images in the naturalist figurative mode has been, for a long time, mimesis. Uh, that is, the impression that by resemblance, uh, the thing I look at is almost alive. Not completely, but almost. Uh, elsewhere, there are other mechanisms that are being used uh, in analogist regimes, for instance. It's the fact of treating the image as if it were uh, part of the, collect of the social collective. For, uh, so for instance, you will treat a uh, deity as if it was a person, not because you infer in this deity, in this image of a deity, that there is an inner uh, 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 source for uh, activating what it is, but because precisely I treat it as a social uh, 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 actor or agent uh, in, uh, um, in the normal course of daily life. This is very clear for deities, for instance, in India, where, that are uh, uh, dressed, uh, given food, uh, uh, put to bed, uh, uh, you sing uh, songs to them, you uh, uh, bring them to visit each other in processions, etc., etc. They are treated as if. Uh, and and uh, uh, another way of rendering active images is being used in Australia, for instance, and it's based on an entirely different process. Uh, the prototypes I was mentioning are activated uh, in rituals. Uh, they are dancers with uh, uh, decorations, but these decorations do not attempt to imitate uh, the appearance of these prototypes. And of, of no one has any idea of what they look like in, in, in general. Uh, they are uh, 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 covered with uh, designs that reproduce the itinerary that these prototypes followed when they were on the surface of the, of the Earth. In other words, what these prototypes are identified by as agents is the trace of the actions they uh, uh, did on the surface of the, of the, of the, of the Earth by uh, 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 rendering visible the design of the itinerary that they followed on the surface of the earth. So it's an indexical uh, 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 um, uh, uh, form of um, uh, uh, displaying uh, their uh, agency. I'll, I'll finish with that. And I'll return to the first aspect that I tried to uh, uh, develop in this book on how do images render visible forms of worlding. I'll do that first. Um, this is a sort of, <laughs> this is the, the model I've been talking about. Uh, 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 the differences between animism, naturalism, totemism, and analogism. It's to uh, uh, render visible precisely uh, the, uh, the, uh, the system of contrasts. Uh, uh, although uh, uh, I, I do not uh, uh, share levi uh, idea that nature and culture are universals, Nevertheless, I'm uh, still a strong structuralist, as you can see by this uh, 
system of contrast. <laughs> I've learned from him uh, that uh, the only way to define a phenomenon is uh, uh, by uh, contrasting this phenomenon with an other phenomena uh, within a group of transformation. And this is a group of transformation. No? Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, start with, uh, with animism. And uh, these are masks that are worn in rituals and ceremonies by the Yupit, uh, which is a group uh, of people living in Alaska that speak an Eskimo language uh, that is belonging to the same family as uh, in Inuktitut, the language that the Inuit speak. And it's, uh, uh, these are uh, masks that are worn uh, in the winter ceremonies when uh, uh, animal spirits are invited in the common house uh, in order to, in a way, thank them for the fact that they give their body to uh, humans uh, for food. And uh, these masks are interesting because they, are, uh, they, they, they play on the contrast between interiority and physicality physicality because they are very recognizable as a mask, in that case of a fox. But at the same time, these masks have often a small human face inserted uh, in it. And this uh, face is not a human in disguise. It is um, a sign that there is a human-like interiority active in the mask. So here it is uh, other forms of uh, showing the interiority. Uh, they are often uh, used, they were often used in pairs. And this is a very uh, uh, economical way of doing it in the sense that the interiority is surmised by the fact that it's a mask that is worn in such a way that you can't uh, escape uh, the inference that there's a human behind it. And so the interiority, the human-like interiority of the animal is rendered obvious by the fact that it is worn by a human precisely. And it is rendered obvious by the fact that it is worn with the two slit for the eyes uh, uh, vertical, uh, vertically. These are, uh, it's, it's very difficult to infer uh, an interiority in a clam. And so in that, in, in that respect, they, uh, uh, human leaves have been added uh, to the, uh, the uh, uh, human face. Uh, this is a, a drawing uh, made by uh, an, uh, an Inuit. And uh, it's interesting because the bear wears a parka. And uh, in fact, in the whole animist archipelago, um, bodies are uh, uh, seen as uh, cloth, uh, clothing. And very often the word for body is the same word as clothing, where people wear clothes. Uh, and so here it's a, it's a doubling of the idea of the body uh, cloth. What is important in animism is precisely metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is not the Ovidian metamorphosis, that is the transformation, the, 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 the perennial transformation of, a, of a, a human person into a plant or an animal. It's a, a, a shift of perspective. Uh, and this shift uh, is, uh, can be obtained by these transformation masks uh, that are used 
on the northwest coast of uh, Canada uh, because they uh, very simply can render visible the fact that you have uh, the, a, 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 a physical uh, uh, exterior, which is the face. In that case, it's a uh, it's, uh, bullhead, a kind of fish that is common in these waters. It opens up in the ritual and reveals the mask of a raven, a sea raven, and the sea raven mask open up, opens up and uh, reveals a small face. This is a very complex process of metamorphosis in the sense that uh, it, uh, it, is, it illustrates in a, in a ritual and in a dance uh, the story of a person who was a great chief, uh, who had the appearance of a bullhead, but also wear, wore, in certain circumstances, masks, and in particular, the mask of a raven, and in other circumstances, revealed his interiority by showing a face. So this is a series of metamorphoses that is rendered, of course, very obvious by the, uh, the, 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 the mask, the, the transformation mask. This is a, another transformation mask, as you can see by the, uh, by the teeth. Uh, it's, uh, it's a spirit that has to be controlled by a shaman because it's an offensive uh, spirit. Um, and this is a, a, an interesting way of uh, showing the possibility of a shift between the physicality and the interiority. The physicality is the, uh, uh, the fox. Yeah, I, I, I put as a title man fox, but it's not, it's, not, it's not properly a man fox. It's a spirit of a fox, which has uh, uh, one part of his face uh, resembling its physicality, resembling a fox, and the other part of the face resembling a human. And so you can shift from one part to the other and affect the metamorphosis uh, 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 and the, the shift of perspective between interiority and physicality. And what is interesting is that uh, the same process has been used uh, in a very different part of the world, among the Betisek uh, in Malaysia. These are uh, uh, autochthonous people of Malaysia. They are not Malayan. And this is the mask of a, uh, 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 made by a shaman of um, uh, a tiger spirit. And you have exactly the same process of division with the, the, this part of the face, which is a tiger face, this part of the face, which is a human face, and you see them, uh, each of the profiles there. And uh, in fact, by moving your, your gaze from one to the other, you can affect the metamorphosis by being caught either in the face of the tiger or in the face of the human uh, uh, interiority of the tiger. It's uh, much like the uh, duck hair illusion, which you know when you look at the duck, uh, in fact, you get caught in the duck and cannot see the hair. And if you look and, and realize that it's a hair, then it's very difficult to get back to the duck, and this shift uh, follows the same, uh, the same lines. This is a, a very uh, telling uh, 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 thing because, of course, the, you, you, the, the, the shift can be done just by lifting your head. Uh, then uh, when the head is down, uh, you have only the loon when your head is up, you see uh, the human dimension of the loon. 
But this can be done also very simply by uh, imitating uh, an animal. When a human imitates, imitates an animal, and of course you realize uh, that in a dance, uh, this, it's a human that does it. And, uh, but also at times, it, you, you have the impression that it's an animal. So this is a drawing by, made by uh, Franz Boas. Uh, but in fact, uh, it, they, they shouldn't uh, be uh, looked at in this way. They should be looked at as they uh, are uh, rendered active in a dance. So this, this is the back of the frog uh, with the, 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 the back legs, front legs, the eyes, the mouth, etc. And so you should uh, imagine these young boys uh, uh, jumping uh, uh, in such a way uh, that suddenly the frog becomes alive, but at the same time you're aware that it's not a frog, it's a young boy also. And so this shift between the, the young boy and the frog is precisely uh, the, uh, the, the shift that allows uh, this idea of metamorphosis. And this is uh, uh, in Amazonia, as in the rest of the uh, animist archipelago, uh, uh, um, animals see them themselves as humans. So they visit humans as humans in their dreams, etc. But they see themselves as human, as humans. And so when they want to distinguish themselves among themselves and between species, what they do is they do the same as humans. They wear uh, uh, paints, decorations on their body. And so when you want, for instance, as a shaman, to go and visit an animal species, what you do is you wear the same decorations as the animals are supposed to wear, on your naked body in order to be identified as a member of this species. So it's a, an ontological camouflage in that respect. No? It's not an imitation of the appearance of the animal. It's a, a, a way of uh, uh, imitating how <coughs> the animals uh, see themselves to distinguish their, uh, uh, themselves as a species. This is a more common uh, kind of image for us, at, at least. And uh, one of the things that uh, became clear to me as I began working on images was that although the, the theoretical uh, definition of what naturalism is, that is human exceptionality in terms of, uh, of cognitive and moral dispositions, and uh, 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 the fact that humans are uh, physical, uh, uh, are, are their, their physical dispositions are uh, ruled by the same rules of nature than the rest of the elements of the world. Although this was uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, thematized, problematized in the 17th century. Uh, by Descartes, by Bacon, by Galileo, etc. The first naturalist images uh, precede uh, these, um, um, these uh, uh, textual or discursive descriptions and, and theories by two centuries. Uh, the first naturalist images appeared in the 15th century and they were based on the same principles uh, of the uh, general uh, naturalist way of worlding, which is uh, the singularity of humans uh, in terms of their interiority, and the fact that the world 
was organized in a systematic way which could be uh, equated to a natural system. And so it was developed in two directions. One of them was in the north uh, of Europe, and this is the uh, Très Rigeur du Duc de Berry, uh, uh, where you can see that th there is an obsessive attempt at describing the world as it is by contrast with uh, the medieval analogist uh, figurations where the, um, the, the elements of the image have a symbolic dimension. They are there because they mean something in terms of, of either uh, heraldics, in terms of Christian history, etc. Here, uh, the, you can see, for instance, that the, 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 the imprints in the, in the, in, in the, in the earth uh, of, the, of this person uh, sewing, uh, uh, this is the Louvre as it was at the time. Uh, uh, and it's uh, from descriptions we have, it's a very accurate description. Uh, so they are ordinary people uh, uh, developing ordinary activities uh, in the uh, dressed as they should be for these uh, activities. Robert Campin is a painter uh, who is a precursor in, the, in that respect. This is the triptych of an Annunciation, and the, the, the central part, the Annunciation, has been uh, retrieved. And you have the donators on the left and St. Joseph on the right. And there is an obsessive uh, uh, attempt, precisely as I said in naturalism, of emulating, at emulating human vision. That is, it's full of little details that were not necessarily uh, deemed necessary in images before that. Um, uh, and the use of certain devices, uh, which have, have become after that very uh, common, such as the so-called Flemish window, which is the first attempt at landscape by framing part of the world uh, through a window, um, which isolates this part of the world uh, within uh, a framework. And you see everything is, uh, the, the, the shutters are uh, blocked. Uh, the, um, the, well, you can see by yourself. And uh, something which is uh, very important also is that is the is the um, the painting of the soul. Uh, the, the first images of naturalism uh, co combined invention of nature or the invention of a depiction of a very precise depiction of the world with the painting of the soul. You don't have this kind of portrait with the uh, the this deep uh, 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 psychological rendering in particular through the gaze uh, in uh, preceding uh, uh, um, images. And this is one of the uh, great achievements of this period. Van Eyck is uh, a little bit uh, uh, younger than Robert Campin. Uh, this is a mystical conversation. It means that the the chancellor, Chancelier Rollin, who is a sort of prime minister, uh, you can see, uh, he looks a little bit like Putin, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, but he, he's, uh, I think his gaze is more intense, no? And, uh, uh, and he, he seems to have a very strong personality. And uh, what he's looking at is, in fact, it's a mystical conversation. It's a typical uh, uh, genre at, the, uh, at that time. What he's looking at is an internal vision 
of uh, the Virgin Mary. And this opens precisely uh, to, uh, on, the, on the landscape, which is incredibly precise, even if it's not constructed uh, uh, according to the uh, monofocal perspective. There are uh, different uh, 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 points, uh, uh, but still it's very convincing, no? So the, the, the duality of the invention of nature through landscape and the portrait of the soul is here very, um, very noticeable. I won't go, uh, I won't expand on naturalism because we would be here until midnight if I did. <laughs> uh, but these are the premises of naturalism. Uh, the interesting aspect of naturalism is that it's, it has a, at least because we know about it, we, th there's a strong historical dimension and dynamism to it. Uh, we know when it appears and we know when it, if not disappears, but at least is profoundly transformed with cubism, that is with a reappearance of polyperspectivism, no? And, uh, the, uh, in the same way that uh, image makers in the 15th century uh, uh, prefigured uh, the emergence of naturalism, one could say, and I'm prepared to say it, <laughs> that uh, modern uh, uh, painting from the cubism onwards uh, prefigures something uh, different which is not naturalism anymore. Uh, and there are many cases among contemporary artists of uh, images that precisely do not uh, fall within the scope of uh, the naturalist code. Ah, yes, well, uh, I forgot that one. <laughs> this is a uh, the, the transformation of, uh, of naturalism, uh, uh, one, one step in it are uh, the uh, peinture de genre in the, in the, um, in the uh, Dutch uh, 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 um, golden century, you know, uh, in the sense that they are, there's a progressive naturalism uh, is born with a contradiction. If humans uh, are uh, elements of nature in terms of their physical dimensions, uh, uh, how can you account for the exceptionality of their interiority? And so this contradiction takes some centuries to appear and to try to be resolved. And of course, what is the, called the, uh, the movement towards naturalization in the neurosciences, in philosophy, etc., is a form of trying to uh, deal with this contradiction. No? That is, that the, the specificity of humans is only an illusion in the sense that precisely they are moral and cognitive uh, dimension is a surface effect of uh, biological uh, uh, dimensions. And so there are different steps in this realization. One of them precisely is the, this kind of painting where the interiority disappears and is replaced by, in fact, the interagency of the uh, of the, of the characters uh, displayed. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the boy who is uh, uh, supposed to be half-brother of Terbor is reading probably the Bible and the woman with the, uh, the second wife, if I remember correctly, of Terbor's father um, is 
seems to be completely indifferent. She is lost in her thought. And the relationship between the two is the, the fact that they are engaged, supposedly, in a common enterprise, but in fact they are completely disconnected from one another, and so their interiorities are dissolved in that respect. Um, this is the obsessive description of the world that I was talking about at the same during more or less the same period. Ah, yes, I forgot that I put these images. The, the 18th century is interesting in the sense that, uh, on the one hand, there are painters like uh, 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 Fragonard, uh, Watteau, uh, who are painters of emotions, uh, eroticism, uh, love, uh, the beauty of bodies and the world, etc. And at the same time, they are uh, uh, people who try to render uh, visible the fact that uh, humans are entirely physical in a way. And it's interesting because uh, Honoré Fragonard on the right is the cousin of Jean Honoré Fragonard, who is the better known. Uh, and he spent his life uh, uh, unveiling the physical dimensions of uh, humans and non-humans also, because he did that with animals. Uh, and uh, of course, this is the last stage of naturalism, when, uh, when uh, uh, images, uh, neuroimagery, attempts at uh, 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 showing the physical dimension of thought. Uh, and so reconciling, in a way, uh, naturalism with itself. And this is done more in scientific images than in artistic images, as I said, because image artists uh, were, became aware uh, uh, much earlier than uh, scientists, than the, f the framework, the naturalist framework was crumbling. So this is another part of the world. It's uh, Australia. Uh, Northwestern Australia. It's a group called the Kunwishku. And um, one way to uh, depict uh, totemism is to show uh, the totemic prototypes uh, as uh, animals according to a technique called the X ray by specialists of this area which uh, uh, reveals the skeleton and the organs of the, of the, of the totems. Um, what is interesting uh, here is that these animals are not the totems. It's been a, it's been a, a puzzle for anthropologists, philosophers, and other people uh, who since the beginning of the of the 20th century had read the ethnography on Australian uh, aboriginals, how can you be descended from an animal? And uh, uh, a very clever linguist by the name of Carl Georg von Brandenstein showed up that, uh, in fact, the names of animals were not names of taxa. They do, did not designate animals exclusively, they, uh, the name of animals, and in particular of totems, were names of qualities. And these names of qualities, like the, uh, the, um, the watcher, the getter, uh, the quick, uh, the slow, etc., were used to name animals. So what is primary here are qualities. And these qualities are shared 
by, of course, the prototype and the non-humans and humans who belong to the totemic group. And so these animals are instantiations of qualities. They are not the proper totems, no, but they are rendered since these qualities are abstract. Uh, it's much easier to uh, represent them as animals that are instantiations of these qualities. This is why you have uh, these uh, two uh, brogas here. Uh, and in order, in the same area among the Kun wish to um, uh, emphasize the similarity of, uh, between the, um, the totemic prototype and the human, uh, here they've been shown in a rather improbable uh, pas de deux uh, to, in order to emphasize the similarity of structure uh, between the two. So the, 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 the prototype is here uh, in such cases like this in relationship with uh, someone else, a human, but never in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a world of its own. There is no decoration, there is no background. It's... Uh, it, it, it's uh, um, it's an embodiment of a structure, in a way. Um, and this one is interesting because they are, it's, they are not only these prototypes uh, instantiated in uh, animals. Some of them are humanoid figures. And here, uh, uh, this uh, being, uh, Luma Luma, uh, uh, incorporates in his body ritual uh, instruments in his testicles, in his in his uh, lungs, uh, and so he is not uh, he is not uh, a person depicted uh, in an environment. He is the world incorporated into his body? There is another, there are different techniques in order to um, uh, express uh, the uh, 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 totemic ways of worlding. Uh, in, the, in Northwest Australia, uh, what is shown are the totemic beings, as we have just seen. In Central Australia, in the most arid part, uh, what is shown is the the traces that the totemic beings have left in the, in the world. And these traces are very physical ones, and they were probably, uh, and still are, uh, described or depicted as uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an aside of the uh, totemic narratives whereby the what uh, the actions that the totemic prototypes uh, uh, undertook when they were on the surface of the earth are depicted by a sort of pictograms on the earth. Uh, and they, they may be, as I said before, they're depicted also on the bodies of dancers who embody the uh, uh, totemic uh, prototypes. They can be uh, uh, depicted also on ritual objects, churinga, uh, ceremonial shields, etc. And these are some of the uh, of the graphemes that are being used uh, among the Walbiri. Uh, and as you can see, they are very simple uh, 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 prints. Uh, of uh, animals and quite realistic in many respects. Uh, and you can, through these prints, uh, uh, tell a story. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, a large number of emu, that are the, the arrows pointing down, um, uh, they walked around the site 
So each, each, each circle is a, is, a, is a camp, and the lines between the camp are uh, uh, itineraries, uh, and in this case, it's a circumvolution. Um, and so it describes actions uh, in a very uh, uh, clear way. And in fact, the, the uh, contemporary uh, paintings that have now acquired a great uh, uh, success uh, in the international art market are uh, made of these same uh, uh, indexes. Yeah, they are prints. Uh, places where people have stopped, itineraries, etc., uh, etc. Et so now we um, um, we move to um, analogism. Analogism, uh, as you may recall, is um, a world of heterogeneous parts where these parts have to be uh, organized in such a way that they become uh, uh, intelligible uh, in spite of the diversity. Chimere, uh, in that respect, uh, uh, a good example of uh, uh, analogous uh, images and in particular, they are a good example of uh, the ability of analogism to incorporate different traditions. In this case, it's a mask that is used in a, a ritual a ceremony uh, in Bolivia, which has become very folklorized now, uh, and which commemorates uh, a number of different uh, histories and circumstances. Uh, some of them are pre-Columbian. Some of them are, refer to uh, 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 the uh, colonial uh, histories. And the mask here combines elements uh, that are typical of the devil, the, uh, the, the horns here. Um, but also uh, typical of the infra world, uh, such as these reptiles, such as uh, these. The, uh, these are the very specific nose that bats uh, display uh, in South America, and the bats are associated to uh, the infra world. Um, and so this this kind of camera is appropriate to uh, combine um, elements uh, that appear to be distinct but have a common uh, general uh, uh, feature that organizes them. Uh, you, you may... Um, the, 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 the basic principle of a chimera, it, it's based uh, on the use of different body parts from different kinds of animals, humans, etc. But they are always more or less adapted to what seems to be an autonomy of life. If you have a, a dragon or Garuda or whatever, uh, the, the, um, the wings will be on the back in order to allow it to fly. It won't be on the feet. It won't be uh, on, on the hin legs, etc. Um, so it's, there is, and the, the, the linking principle, the principle that organizes this diversity, in that case then, is uh, the, uh, the apparent autonomy, uh, uh, biological autonomy of the chimera. This is another form of chimera, which is a bit more complex because it's made of uh, it's it's uh, it's a being that is being that is made of many different beings, 
although here also there is uh, an apparent uh, logical, biological dimension to this co composite being. And this, this is an example of the, the, the uh, correspondence between macrocosmos and microcosmos that I mentioned before. And it's interesting because it's taken from the same Trichichdor du Duc de Berry, the same source as the first image we saw of uh, what I uh, saw as uh, the beginning of naturalism. Meaning that in the 15th century, there is a, a still a process of superposition between naturalist images and analogist images such as uh, this one, correspondence of the part of the body with the signs of the zodiac, no? which is a, a typical uh, uh, um, image that dates to uh, 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 ancient Egypt. Same form of correspondence also, uh, the subtle body. Um, which renders the, the correspondence sometimes very difficult because of the uh, manifold correspondences that uh, the, um, the image try to, tries to evidence. This is a form of, a form of correspondence which is interesting because it's, uh, it's a correspondence between... Uh, um, it's, 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 in, it's iconic, in fact, it's a landscape, and it's uh, uh, from a people in uh, northwestern uh, Mexico, and these are uh, uh, put into uh, as votive offering into uh, caves, and the uh, the uh, uh, image on the surface of this shield represents the Cora territory and the places in the Kora territory which are associated with the people who made the shield and who give it uh, to the deities in the cave. So it's, it's, it's a complex level of correspondence between places, pla people who have gone through these places. In some cases, it may be San Francisco or Los Angeles, uh, and a, 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 a deity uh, that uh, uh, obtains this uh, gift, these votive shields in a cave. This is another way of, uh, of uh, I mean, all analogous images are images of relations. Uh, in that case, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a relation uh, which is well known uh, to anthropologists. It's a relation of descent between an ancestor here, the head, and a, a number of generations. And in fact, all these generations have a common uh, dimension because they are all descended from the same ancestor, but they are all different. And it is shown by uh, 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 sculpting them in a, in a, in a, by shifting their position at each uh, generation. So it is an encompassment of different generations by uh, uh, an apical ancestor, which is a typical principle of analogous principle. This is a, also a, a form of encompassment. It's uh, it's a mask that is used in Sri Lanka for uh, curing uh, difficult diseases. Each of the, uh, of, the, of the characters on the side are uh, uh, demons that are responsible for a certain kind of disease. And the encompassing de uh, demon here uh, is 
at the same time the chief and the embodiment of all the other demons. So it's also a process of encompassment, but a little bit different from the preceding one. And this is uh, uh, what is called a messa in the, uh, it's, it's the same word that is used uh, in ritual context in Mesoamerica and the Andes. It comes from the Spanish mesa, probably also misa, the, the, the mass. Uh, and uh, this is a, a non-indigenous uh, mesa. Uh, indigenous mesas are usually uh, scale models of the world. Uh, and uh, that can be activated in order to maintain the balance of the world. In this case, it's a therapeutic uh, uh, device which is composed, as you can see, of very different elements, uh, pre-Columbian in some cases, uh, uh, Christians, there are uh, statues of saints, uh, small uh, uh, files and bottles that contain uh, different uh, producers. Here you, uh, you have uh, pre-Columbian uh, 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 either real or fake uh, uh, elements. Uh, these are symbols of power. Uh, they are arms, uh, 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 swords, etc. Or baston de mando, that is uh, 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 canes that are that symbolize the power of uh, uh, traditional authorities, etc. And this is a sort of it's it's a device that can be activated by tracing uh, a path between the different elements. It's a curing device in the sense that the, 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 the curandero, the, 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 uh, the therapeut, will, by talking with the, the person who is uh, ill, will try to define how uh, the etiology of his uh, 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 illness and reconstruct uh, um, a pass between different elements that is different at each time, depending on the, of course, the, the, the different etiologies, and that correspond also in the, in the general disposition to the biography of the therapeuts. So it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's a potential, or it's a, it's, it's, it's a device that allows to produce an infinite number of relations between a person and artifacts, which is very analogous precisely. Uh, this is a very well-known uh, um, uh, artifact in the British Museum. It's a deity which uh, uh, bears on his body uh, small representations of not completely itself, but realizations in other forms of itself. Uh, and so it has a fractal dimension, no? It's an embodiment of, uh, by a major figure of elements that are iteration of itself at different scales. And this is, of course, a very also classical form of analogist uh, uh, image, uh, the, the fractal uh, dimension, fractal being used this in a somewhat loose sense. This is for if there is any physicist in the audience <laughs> or mathematician. Um, and this is another example of fractal designs, uh, the tsikuri. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the motifs are uh, the same, but at different uh, level. And so they tend to give an idea of propagation uh, at the same time 
that they insist on the fact that the uh, uh, encompassment at different uh, level has a dynamism of its own. That's all. <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, it's been a real uh, presentation, so I'm, I'm here mostly to moderate uh, a debate. Uh, we will have probably 20 minutes for that. Um, I'm, I'm just starting by a question, but then I will put it together with others so that uh, we have enough time uh, for replies. So... Um, my first question is, is something that has to do with what you presented, together with um, something that kept my attention in the film that we watched here in Coutouges last week, uh, Composer Le Monde, and also uh, the full proposal of your book, which is the connection between these four ontologies. Uh, and you say in the first uh, chapter of the book that this is not uh, meant to be closed cosmologies, uh, and I'm quoting, or a culture of the in the classical sense of the word. And you, you open your book with a, an epigraph by Merleau-Ponty, I, uh, the I and, and mine. And, um, and in the film, composing worlds, uh, there is a moment in which you talk about change and you say that, um, that change necessarily occurs, and I'm quoting again, from elements we already understand. And so this also sounds to me, sounds to me much of a kind of a phenomenological perspective on historicity, together with a very structural thinking, so my question is, uh, how do you conceive these transformations between different ontologies, types? Um, there are moments in which you talk about images, um, kind of construction of hybrids through images, but uh, in a more kind of a conceptual way. Um, so how would you imagine, how could for instance, uh, naturalists' ways of composing worlds gain elements from other ontologies uh, to leverage change. So this is the question that I'm uh, that I'm putting in, in order also to put together with uh, with uh, with the film, and we can pick up other one or two questions from from the the audience, so that we have enough time for replies, so we have one there, and another one upstairs. Uh, well, the, the first word that comes to my mind is uh, gratitude. Gratitude for your conference, and gratitude for all of your work, namely this uh, trilogy, this kind of trilogy, Par de la nature et culture, la fabrique des images, uh, and now Les Formes du Visible, que they were uh, very important to my research. I'm studying uh, Paleolithic art on the Coa Valley. And, uh, and I, well, uh, uh, if we regard only the images, uh, as the majority of my colleagues that use your approach do, uh, I think we can say that Paleolithic art is... Uh, is, um, comes, emerges from an ontology that, uh, from my point of view, is dominated by what you call the, the totemic mode of identification. But, uh, as, uh, as you say, uh, that is not enough. The images by themselves are not enough to, to tell us what, what is the mode of identification that uh, dominates uh, uh, the, the ontology from where the images uh, emerge. 
Now, uh, because of that, I also try to, to, to analyze uh, what you uh, call in one of your Cours du Collège de France, uh, the, the social appropriation of space, if my memory doesn't fail me. And regarding this, uh, and you, in Part de la Culture et Nature, you talk a little about that regarding the, the analog, analogist mode of, of identification. It's a it's landscapes filled with uh, uh, analogical relations uh, and um, a kind of big uh, Kabila houses uh, uh, studied by Bourdieu. And, and of course, the totemic landscapes are also very well known, uh, namely in Australia. Uh, I tried to, to search for this kind of studies regarding animistic uh, 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 landscapes. Uh, I only found, uh, uh, I, I found very few uh, studies regarding the uh, uh, space, uh, um, namely Peter Jordan's study of the Canty and uh, uh, Thomas Thornton's study of the Tinglet uh, landscape. And uh, what appears to me is that I don't know, uh, uh, also in your book of uh, 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 Les Entretiens avec uh, Pierre Charbonnier, you mention, uh, if I, again, if my memory doesn't fail, just, that. Uh, sorry, just. Oh, okay. To so, these ontological meaning of places that, that we find in totemic landscapes. So, the, 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 the dependence of the, of the, the collectives regarding the, the places from the infant spirits emerge, there's something uh, of the same sort in animic societies. In? In, in uh, animistic so, uh, oh, yes. societies, mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, for instance, in Northwest, in Northwest Coast, w from what I read in Thomas Thornton's book, the, the uh, memories are attached to places, but places can change from one collective to the other. So there's not this, this type of uh, ont uh, the, the sites are not uh, ontological anchors to the, the to the collectives. I think this is very important to to understand. I'll, to, to keep in mind when studying rock art, that besides being images, Thank you. they are also I think it's, uh, fixed in, in yeah. space. Thank you so much. Sorry. So, uh, there is someone over there. Hello, uh, thank you. Um, I get a question which is pretty practical related to this moment of mutation between analogism and naturalism um, in Europe as well and this time of the 15th century related to the past and uh, all the geopolitical as well happening there and all that could inform question of the representation, uh, organization as well as the attention and as you said, uh, as the representation inform as well the politics, this kind of cultural inter effect that's played at this moment and why, like, just having a little point of political situation there, because I think if we are talking about change right now and how to change this kind of paradigm, uh, which is more a mutation than taking stuff from other colonized culture, but like really changing something, we have to understand a bit more what is a political relating to that. So I'm, I'm just wondering. I don't mm. know if it was clear, it was a question transforming into something else. So would you like to reply now to the three? Yeah. Yes, well, I think the, the two questions are, are on, on change. How do things change? Um, it's, um, it's a question that has puzzled uh, many great minds over the centuries. Um, what I find surprising is not so much that things change, but that things do not change. That it's a stability. Uh, 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 in, and uh, so the reason uh, that the thing we have to understand is why at, at some moment this uh, stability fails. Um, it's the case with uh, uh, naturalism which appeared in a certain place at a certain time and uh, nowhere else, although there could have been emergence of naturalism uh, in, 
in, in other places, could have emerged in, uh, in ancient Greece, for instance. It could have emerged in, uh, in uh, China. It could have emerged in, uh, in medieval Islam, uh, medieval uh, uh, Arabic world. Uh, it didn't for a number of reasons. Um, it's um, what, what we can do and that what the social sciences and historians in particular have done is uh, try to figure afterwards uh, the reasons for the change. Uh, there's a, a tradition, the history of uh, ideas uh, uh, with very good examples. I think of one which has very much influenced me when I was a young man, I, when I discovered this book uh, by uh, someone who is an historian of ideas by the name of Paul Hazard, which is called The Crisis of the European Consciousness, A Crise de la Conscience Européenne, and which tries precisely to do what I've been trying to do, that is understand this shift that appears at the same time uh, all over, of not exactly at the same time, but in many European countries, and which have been explained uh, alternatively by uh, 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 discoveries and colonialism on the one hand, by uh, 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 intellectual uh, uh, turmoil uh, based on the uh, rediscovery and reinterpretation of ancient texts of the of text of antiquity uh, with uh, the uh, 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 wars of religion, things like that, no? Uh, I'm glad I'm not an historian because I don't feel the necessity to pinpoint uh, a certain class of event uh, in order to understand that there, is a, there, there has been a change. What I've tried to do uh, in Beyond Nature and Culture is to understand change in terms of transformation of... And this is a, 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 a procedure that... Uh, the procedure that inspired me was by Marx uh, when he, in his book uh, Forms That Precede Capitalist Production. Uh, it's an essay where after having defined the structure of capitalism, he tries to understand how this structure came about, and that is its regressive history, in the sense that he pinpoints certain elements that appeared and that at a certain time coalesced in order to form the structure of capitalism. I think it's almost impossible to do any other form of history than regressive history in that, in that respect. And, uh, or even more abstract, what I, what I uh, attempted to do in uh, Beyond Nature and Culture, which is structural history, but it's not his history in, in a classical sense. It's how, among an arc of neighboring societies that may be very wide, some elements are present, another absent, uh, and so there is no idea of temporality in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that respect, but of uh, causal dimensions of the structure that they form. Uh, and so one can understand that, that to achieve a certain structural form, certain elements have to be present. I'm sorry, it's very abstract, but I, 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 in, in Beyond Nature and Culture, I did that by... Uh, 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 traveling from uh, northern Siberia to uh, eastern uh, uh, or western uh, North America, uh, trying to see what elements were there and uh, or not there uh, to transform from a system to another one. So these are the the, the way I conceive of change, you no know, structural transformations, and. Uh, and so it's difficult to connect with actual change. Uh, I, 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 I'm trying to, I'm involved in actual change, in fact, 
uh, by being uh, active in movements, uh, in particular in France, that uh, uh, struggle against the appropriation of common goods, land, water, things like that. And uh, I can uh, see uh, why I do it and uh, the uh, circumstances under which I can do it. But there's a certain discrepancy between the way I see uh, world history, if you wish, and the type of political involvement I'm engaged in. Um, and I think uh, it, to understand change in that respect uh, uh, requires uh, uh, empirical studies. As you mentioned in that book, I uh, try to understand forms of hybridity. But of course, you can only understand forms of hybridity if you have a clear idea of what is hybridized, that is, of the elements that combine together. This is why models are necessary. Uh, you can't speak of hybridity in abstract terms. Uh, 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 you, you have to understand the, it, it, it's, it, it, it's a study of structural combination, no? And so one of the cases I studied are the Tsimshian, uh, which is a, an Amerindian group, uh, northern uh, British Columbia uh, in, uh, in Canada, who uh, are, have strong animist elements and strong totemic uh, elements. And how do they combine these in images? And I, I think that many of the, the collectives that uh, historians or anthropologists or social scientists are uh, interested in are uh, hybrids in some respects. And so um, uh, this, the, 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 um, to understand the conditions of change, I think one has to, uh, in the first hand, uh, be uh, uh, aware of the forms of hybridization because then what is combined uh, can be analyzed as a historical process, for instance, or a structural process in, uh, in cases where there's no historical trace of the uh, transformation. Uh, but I, again, um, it's um, since following Marx precisely, I think only regressive history is possible uh, or worthwhile. Uh, it's very difficult to apply this to the present, except in terms of general ambitions, no, to fight for such a, such a cause, and, uh, but not necessarily in a very scientific manner. Yes, that's... That's about the, the kind of answer uh, I can give. And now in terms of places, uh, I've, uh, uh, I, I am convinced that these, uh, what I call modes of identification, the, the, the four ways of worlding, um, express themselves in different forms of life in uh, organization of duration, in the organization of space, in images, figuration. That's why I devoted a, a whole book to this topic, uh, in forms of narratives, perhaps. And it's true, as you mentioned, that in, uh, regarding uh, uh, the organization of space, animism uh, is very fluid because it's based on metamorphosis. And metamorphosis is possible everywhere. There are places that are uh, more prone to the experience of metamorphosis, like uh, water bodies, you know, the Alice and the mirror of the, of the water, uh, uh, because they offer a physical 
dimension to the possibility of shifting uh, from one perspective to another when one goes under the water. Uh, but it's true that by contrast with totemism or analogism, there is no uh, fixed uh, uh, form of, uh, of organization of spaces by contrast with temporality. Temporality, uh, the, 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 the forms of duration are uh, what, what the, the myth, for, what, what we usually call myth, and that Lévi-Strauss defined come, uh, as, as, as a period when uh, humans and animals uh, got on well together. Uh, I see that not as a temporal dimension, but as an axiomatics in the sense that uh, myth uh, recounts the events uh, that provoked the emergence of discontinuities in uh, physical discontinuities in the world. That is when animals acquired their physical form. Uh, before that, humans and animals precisely had an entirely cultural life. They cooked, they married according to rules, etc., etc. They had uh, 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 technical uh, tools. And, and then uh, a series of catastrophic uh, events transformed uh, animals into what they are now, that is, still persons, but persons with a different body. And so it's an axiomatic in the sense that it's the condition for understanding the actual world. But that doesn't mean that it took place in a very, uh, in, a, in, 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 in a distant uh, uh, past. Uh, although myths uh, uh, begin with uh, a long time ago, uh, for instance, in, in Achuar, a long time ago, Yaunshu, uh, uh, can be used for myth, or if you ask a question as to, have you seen someone? Mm -hmm. And uh, the person will answer, oh, he was here a long time ago, and that may be five <laughs> minutes before. <laughs> so it's just mean that it is temporarily before the actual moment, no? So in that sense, it, it's an axiomatics because it explains, it helps to explain the actual situation whereby uh, non-humans, in particular animals, but plants also, uh, have an interiority like humans because this is the thing they've retained from their transformation, but they have different bodies and different capacities, physical dispositions that uh, allow them to act differently in the world. So in terms of, of temporality, yes, there's a definite uh, animist temporality. In terms of spaces it's, 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 uh, and location, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, I think um, there is a there is a uh, an indigenous an indigenous community uh, in the Ecuadorian Amazon called Sarayaku, uh, which offers a very interesting contradiction in terms of relation to territory. Let's say they came to the uh, COP uh, twenty one in Paris in. Uh, uh, when was it? 2015, was it? Or, well, uh, and they asked for uh, the recognition of their uh, territory as a specific protected space uh, because, and they, they used a very interesting argument, because uh, the relations there have to be protected between humans and non-humans, and these relations, these material and spiritual rela relations, they use the word in Spanish, uh, are original and need to be protected. So they ask for the protection of their territory because of the kind of relation that were deployed in this place. So this is a very animist way of conceiving a territory. But at the same time, thanks to an NGO, they devised a very uh, 
clever way of protecting their territory, but an entirely different one, which is completely Westphalian in the sense of the Westphalian states. They planted uh, trees with visible flowers all around their territories so that it can be recognized from the sky. And this is an absolutely non-animist way of uh, conceiving of a territory, but one which is directed towards us, that is, people flying in helicopter in order to find places where they can uh, drill for oil. Uh, so there's this kind of contradiction also. Uh, yeah, we have another couple of questions. Can, can you stay until 9 o'clock? No. So, so we'll have to be very brief. <laughs> Uh, but we can pick up uh, these final two questions. Thank you. <coughs> I was wondering if you would apply your analysis to the prehistoric culture. If you look at the paintings in Lascaux, in Chauvet, whatever, with the little we know about prehistoric man, can we say something about their relationship between humans and non-humans? <laughs> yes, it's a recurrent question. It's a very difficult one to answer uh, because it's based on analogy. Uh, the, the, some of the uh, features of uh, Paleolithic uh, 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 cave uh, uh, paintings is that there are uh, uh, very few humans, uh, mainly animals, no uh, environment for these animals, and uh, so it, it looks very similar to what we know of uh, Australian, Northern Australian image making, no? The representations of totems. We have no idea if this, uh, uh, if this uh, 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 induction is, uh, is uh, we'll never know, in fact. Um, but at the same time, I, uh, um, a few months ago, I discovered in uh, the Museum of Tübingen, Germany, uh, small ivory figures that were very similar to uh, ivory figures that are present among the Inuit, the Koryak, and the, the Periarctic people, and which depict suspended movement. And this, I interpret these uh, little figures in, uh, in, uh, in uh, walrus ivory uh, to be uh, uh, animist in the sense that they figure very, in, uh, very clearly uh, an animal that can be identified. They are very s small, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, in, in a position of suspended movement in the sense that it's, if it's a bird, it's about to, uh, 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 to take flight. Um, and this indicates precisely the interiority of the intention, at least, of the animal. It means that it's, it's not, uh, that it, it has intentions, that it has purposes uh, in life. And this I interpret among the, the the, the, the periarctic people as uh, being a typical animist uh, uh, figure. So there may have been a, a combination uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, figurative regimes. Uh, for instance, the, the, the famous metamorphosis of the, the lion man, you know, uh, which is uh, was, uh, uh, comes from the same place, no, in uh, Swa, 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 Swabia, what do you say in uh, Jura Swab, yes. Swabian Jura. <laughs> and the, the uh, it's very difficult to see whether it's, it's a metamorphosis or if it's a chimera. In one case, it would be a, a metamorphosis, it would be typical, uh, typically animist. If it's a chimera, it would be typically analogist. But I don't think it's analogist. I don't think it's a chimera because 
I, I, uh, my impression is that uh, analogism is a transformation of animism for logical reasons, no? And so it appeared uh, uh, after animism. I, if I have to uh, uh, make a very broad uh, 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 pronunciamento, uh, it would be that the initial modes of identification are animism and totemism. And then animism is a transformation. Uh, the analogism is a transformation of animism and transforms itself in, into naturalism. So in terms of evo evolutionary uh, uh, speculations, uh, there would be a line there, while totemism is a very stabilized uh, mode of identification. In Australia, it has been probably uh, active for a very long time, if we judge from images precisely, uh, uh, we have no other way to uh, establish that. Essentially, we could be listening to you till midnight, as you suggested <laughs> before, but we really have to close. Um, so I have instructions that we have to finish. <laughs> so thank you so much for this really wonderful talk, and thanks everyone for coming. So mm.